Yo, peace was good. Welcome to an installment of albums that never came out officially. This is gonna be part eight. Um, I just want to say thank you to everybody for all the support, um, all the dope comments, you know, things like that. Um, one thing though, some of y'all, I gotta, y'all gotta stop this. Is I know when I post a video, I know y'all don't check the whole video. Like I'll just post, I'll post it. And then y'all just, and y'all just, you know, y'all, y'all just comment right away. I'm like, damn, you like, you didn't even see the video, you know, like, what the fuck, you know? But it is what it is. Um, let me start off with the first album of the video. Um, the first album I'm gonna talk about is Clips with their first album, uh, exclusive audio footage that was set to be released back in 1999. Um, a lot of people think the Lord Willing album was his first album. That's their first album commercially, but their real first album is actually called Exclusive Audio Footage. And um, that never came out. It was supposed to come out out of Electra Records, which, you know, it's no surprise. It's, this is not the first time that they shelved albums, you know. Um, the I and I album, the, the Life I Lead, which a lot of people known as, uh, know as um, Center of Attention, Never came out until like years later. Um, yeah, so they were on that sucker shit, Sylvia Roan. Um, I think that was her name, Sylvia Roan, you know, fucking shoving people's albums and shit. So, clips, exclusive, exclusive audio footage being no different. Um, production wise, it's, 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 you know, it's typical Neptunes. Um, you know what I mean? Yeah, it definitely has that authentic trademark. You know Neptune sound that we all know about. Um, you could definitely tell it sounds like stuff that they could have used on Lord Willen. Um But you know it's like an earlier sound. But it was kind of experimental for um, for Neptunes though, because it was sound like something that you never heard from them before, which was pretty dope. Uh, there was a there was a video and a single from that album called The Funeral, but. Um, and I remember seeing the video back in 2003, 2004. Um, and I remember, but when I seen it, it didn't, it didn't seem like from 1999. It felt like it was recent. Like they just recently did that uh, video, you know, at that time around 2003, 2004. Um, it's just the song is old. That's the only thing. Um, but yeah, so that's. Exclusive audio footage by Clips that was supposed to come out back in 1999. Uh, the second album, at least, yeah, the second second album, uh, Hitman, uh, Hitman being uh, Dr. J's protege at one point. Um, he was supposed to drop an album called The Murder Weapon back in 2000. Uh, Hitman, known for his, like I say, his affiliation with you know um, Dr. Dre, him, Buddha. And um, Mailman are responsible for the sound of Crying 2001, you know what I mean? And of course, Dr. J too. But I think those three, Buddha, uh, Mailman, and Hitman, they were responsible, they were responsible for that sound of the Crying 2001 album. And I feel like they don't get the, the proper credit that they deserve, but that's just my opinion. Anyways, getting back to that, um, he was supposed to drop the album Murder Weapon in 2000, and um, you know, he ended up leaving Aftermath Records in 2001 because he felt like he was just pretty much tossed in the back burner. Because at that time in 2000, 2001, Dr. Dre's most focus was on, you know, obviously on Eminem, uh, Eve. Um, who else? Truth Hurts. Um, you know, people like that. So he was like, fuck this, I'm leaving. I'm leaving. And then later on, a couple years later, he dropped an interview with Dub CNN, um, which is a hip-hop site, you know, due to the... Um, mostly dealing with West Coast artists and stuff like that. And I found an article with Hitman doing the interview with them and the interview asked about the, the Murder Weapon album and so he pretty much explained that um, those are songs it's like some of the songs were um, you know songs that he was rapping over other people's instrumentals but then he had some other like original tracks that he did for that album so 
in 2005, he ends up coming out with um, the name of the name of his album, The Hitmanic Versus. And that with that album, which came out officially, um, was some of the songs from the Murder Weapon album that came out eventually. So, um, but yeah, no, excuse me, I'm sorry, not that it came out. You guys know what I'm trying to say, the Hitmanic Versus is what Murder Weapon was supposed to be. That's what I meant to say. Um, yeah, so, and then, you know, the interview asked the, yeah, the journalist asked him, like, yo, so how, how were you able to make money or survive financially? You know, without doing any work, he said because of the publishing, you know, the royalties that he got from the Chronic 2001 album. So he was able to eat off of that. So I think that's pretty cool. You know what I'm saying? But yeah, so that's it, man, with Murder Weapon. It was set to be released in 2000. Uh, three, number three, uh, Charlie Baltimore, The Diary. That was an album that was supposed to come out back in 2002 or 2003. Um... This would be like the second album that she ever got shelved. Because you guys know, I've mentioned it before, that her Cold as Ice album was supposed to drop in 1999. But it got shelved. Because I think at the time she was on the Epic Sony Records. So they shelved that album. But that album ended up coming out back in, I think, 2009 or 2012 um, digitally. And stuff like that. Sorry about that. Um, yeah, so the diary, like I said, she came up with a couple of singles. Of, she came up with like five singles. No one does it better. The diary, Hey Charlie, Philly's Finest, and Charlie Charlie. And truth of the matter is, I don't even remember any of those songs, to be honest with you. The only songs I remember from her were the songs, um, oh, what's, that, what's the name of that song? Um, Down As Bitch, as it was, that was featured on that sync, on that. I think it was featured on the Ink album that they dropped back in 2002. Um, I think it was featured on that album. Or I think it was featured on... Um, I think it was on that album it was featured on. Or the Shanti album. I don't remember. But anyways, um, I think supposedly the album was supposed to be like a more of a, a autobiographical album of Charlie Baltimore. Uh, just based on what I read on the... Um, uh, you know, on, on Wikipedia and stuff like that. And, um, you know, that, that, that kind of thing. And, you know, she left because, you know, she wasn't being promoted right. You know, people weren't really promoting her. And she ended up leaving Murder, Inc. Records because of that. So, so this would be, like, the second time that she got shelved. So, which kind of sucks. But some of those songs you can hear on on YouTube. So, definitely check them out. I've, I've heard a couple of them. And they're, they're pretty good. I like it. And I like it, you know. I think in 2003, if I would have heard it, I wouldn't like it. Because at that time, I was, like, so anti-mainstream at that time. Because I just wasn't feeling how music was at that time. But, you know, it is what it is. But the stuff then is better than the stuff now. I, I, I'll keep it at that. But, yeah. So, that's uh, Charlie Baltimore with a diary. That was supposed to come out in 2002, 2003. Uh, number four, uh, DJ Battlecat with Gumbo Roots. Uh, DJ Battlecat, legendary producer from the West Coast, Cali. Um, he's worked with people like um, Snoop Dogg. He's worked with, um, I believe he's worked with the Dog Pound. I believe he's worked with them. He's worked with uh, Spice One. He's worked with Domino. In fact, I think he did the whole album, Domino's whole album. Uh, you know, Ghetto Jam, uh, Astro Days, Sweet Potato Pie. He did that whole album, and, and that that is a West Coast classic. And I don't really hear too many people talk about that album, but that is a great, 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 great album. Um, he's worked with, yeah, he's worked with Domino. Who else he worked with? Spice One, he's worked with Spice One. A whole bunch of other people in the West Coast he's worked with. But anyways, he was supposed to come out with an album called Gumbo Roots back in 1995. Um, it never came out, but it did come out back in 1999. But the promo... God oh, damn. Sorry about that. Um, it was supposed to... It ended up coming out back in 1999. But then it was the only the promo copies of the album came out. But then it, it officially came out back in 2012. But the only thing with that was that it only came out in Japan. It was a Japan-only re release, which was some bullshit. 
But it is what it is. And I see, I try to go for a copy, and I see them go for like $150. And I, I, there's no way I'm paying $150 for a CD. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to do that. Like I said, the most I spent on a CD was on the Terrorist album from Rap A Lot Records. Their first album, The Terror Strikes, um, Always Busy and Never Personal. That's only that's the only amount of money I spent on a CD. Anything else? No. I'm not. Fuck that. Fuck that. But I would like to hear the, that album, the, the Gumbo Roots by DJ Battle Cat. So, that's number four. Uh, number five, uh, Smith & Wesson. Uh, they had an album out called Spit Again that was supposed to drop in 2002. Um, at the time, they were known as Coco Brothers. Uh, they were under uh, Rockets Records. And you guys pretty know the story why they changed the name Smith & Wesson. Some of you guys know? No? All right. For those that don't know, Smith & Wesson, you know, you know, being part of, you know, Boot Camp Click, um, kind of went their separate ways. As far as a group from Duck Down Records, and they kind of had their own situation. Um, in 1998, they released their second album, The Rude Awakening album, which was a very underrated album. I don't really hear too many people talk about that album because a lot of people are stuck on the, the Shining album, which is a great album. I love that album, but I think I think The Rude Awakening album is just another. Is it, it definitely has some filler tracks, but. It definitely got some dope heat on that album. Uh, the song, the album is known for singles like One on One. Um, what's that song? Yeah, One on One, Black Trump, and um, Spanish Harlem. Like, those are the three singles of the album. And they had to change their name to Coco Brothers because, you know, the Smith & Wesson gun company sued them because of the name. Even though they were, in, they were spelled different. But they told them like you know you can't you can't really send the music under that name so they had to change it in Coco Brothers so that's why the second album, album was called Coco Brothers and I think that's why the second album didn't really sell very well because of that so you know it is what it is on that but anyways um fast forward right after the Rude Awakening album they released a novel they released a single like an underground single back in 2000 called Super Brooklyn and that song is what got them signed to Rockers Records. Uh, it's when they sampled the Super Mario theme song um, to that song, and then they flipped it, and then they put it out. I believe that song was actually featured on a compilation album called Game Over, which I do have. I showed you guys that a while back. Um, I think Domingo had, had spared that project, the producer Domingo. But he had some he had something to do with that. He was like key... He, was, he, he had a key role in that album, the making of that album. Um, but yeah, um, that, that, but anyways, that song Super Broken is what got them signed to Rockers Records. And then they were working on the album called Spit Again. Uh, they made a couple songs. There was a single, there was a song called Spit Again, the self titled track that was featured on the Song Bomber 3 album. They put out a song. On the lyricist Sounds two that came out back in two thousand, I uh, forgot the name of the song. Um, that was featured on lyricist Sounds two. They worked on the album and the album got shelved and that never got released. And at that time, Ruckus Records was going downhill anyways because they were going through a lot of financial strains. So the album just you know fell victim to that and it got shelved because of that. But there is a song. Um, that was on that album that actually ended up being on their, um, on their, I guess their third studio album, uh, the Reloaded album that came out in 2005, um, very dope album by the way, the song Tools of the Trade, that was actually featured on uh, Spit Again, but then they transferred it to um, that album, um, the Reloaded album in 2005, which is a smart move because that's like one of the best songs of that album because I've heard some of the songs of Spit Again. I just wasn't a fan. So it was kind of a good thing they they shelved it. But I would like for it to see the light of day because um, just to have it, just to, you know, just to have it, you know, as a collector's item, just to have it in the collection to, you know, just kind of like to complete the Smith & Wesson, um, yeah, the Smith & Wesson discography. You know what I mean? So... 
that's us spit again with Smith and Wesson and Coco Brothers. That was due to release in 2002. Uh, number six, EA Ski uh, with Earthquake. That was due to be released in 1990, 1998. Um, battle, I mean, EA Ski. Legendary hip hop producer, and he's a rapper too. Uh, at one point, he was under No Limit Records with Master P. He's worked with Master P. He's worked with the Real Untouchables, aka True, um, which consisted of Master P, Sophie Shaka, C Murder. Um, put out that, um, they put out a couple of albums. Um, ESK did a couple of production on some of those albums, especially the early albums. Um, yeah, and then he ended up putting out EPs, you know, singles, things like that. He's known for the song Blast If I Have To, um, which was featured on the Friday soundtrack. If you guys don't know that song, there's a video for that. It's a, it's a scene where um, where um, Smokey and Craig was getting paranoid because, you know, Big Worm was out. Um, he sent people to kill Smokey because he owned the money. The two hundred dollars, and then there was a scene where he seen the van creeping up, and then they, you know, he started driving towards them, started shooting at them. What well, the a song in the in in the background is ESK's "Blast If I Have To," and so that's a song by ESK, like I said before. And um, he was working on an album, Earthquake, and it was supposed to come out in nineteen ninety eight. Again, it was on the DreamWork Records. They shoved the album, and um, I think he ended up suing the company, and I don't know what, what was the outcome of that. Let me look that up real quick. Yeah, it says, originally meant to be released as ESK's debut studio album. However, due to DreamWorks at the time, not, one, not wanting to release the album, okay, ESK filed a $30 million lawsuit against DreamWorks. Um, Earth was recorded while ESK was signed to Relativity Rec- Records. And on March 19th, 2009, the album was leaked. Yeah, so, um, it got, it got leaked. So, um, I would love to get a copy of the album, but, you know, who knows if that will ever see the light of day, you know what I mean? So, um, it sucks. But I've heard, like, one song from that album is a self-titled song, Earthquake, with Ice Cube. It's actually pretty good. I actually like the song, so, um... Especially around that time because, you know, Ice Cube, when you put out the War and Peace Volume 1 album, I I don't know. I just was not feeling that album at all, man. But I would have to revisit and I have to do a review on that album. I have to eventually do a review on that album, the Volume 2, and the Bow Down album, and the Terrorist Threats album by Westside Connection. So definitely stay tuned for that. But anyways, getting back to EA Ski. That's the story with that album. It was supposed to come out, but it never did. So, but it, it eventually came out digitally. So you got to try, probably find that. You know, go do your Googles. Go and find that album. So that's ESK with Earthquake, due to be released in two, uh, 1998. Uh, number seven. I'm not sure if I was should have added this, but I did anyways, because you know usually when people push back an album. They usually leave over, they end up re-recording tracks and they leave over tracks. And the album is Cameron's Purple Haze album. Uh, the album was supposed to be released back in 2003, but it got pushed back. Uh, it, got, it got getting pushed back, getting pushed back, getting pushed back. Um, because at the time, he was doing the Rockefeller Records and then he left Rockefeller Records and stuff like that. And um, I forgot what record label he was on the... Um, I know he had his own thing, Diplomatic Records, Diplomatic Records, or Diplomat Records, but then I'm, I, I think he was under somebody, I just don't remember who. Then he, he it kept getting pushed back, getting pushed back, and then it finally came out in 2004. I think he came out like, I think like April of 2004, if I not remember. I remember that album coming out on my senior, no, like early, like, Later on in my junior year of high school, I remember that. And I remember that song was really big back in those back in those days, man. I mean, you had cash rock and pink pink tees, which I was never into that shit. You would never catch me anything wearing pink. Now yes, but back then nah. Nah, 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 nah. And Purple Haze, that was a pretty good album. I I, I fucked with Purple Haze. 
Um, the only reason I put that on, I put this on a, on this list, was because usually when you push back an album, it usually means that you know they usually is because labels, label situations, or. Let me take a Uh, sorry about that. Yeah, so uses because either the labels keep pushing it back or because of the fact that, you know, the artists want to work on new songs. They feel like at the last minute, the songs that they had before didn't really fit the album, that kind of thing. So I think that was the case with Purple Haze, and that's why the album came out in 2004. All right. Um, pretty dope album. I like it. It's not his best album, but... Pretty good. I fucks with it. <laughs> Woo! Excuse me. Alright. Um, number eight, Capone Noriega with the new religion. Uh that was supposed to come out back in two thousand three. Um Unfortunately that album never came out because um they came out with a sync they I think at the time they were under Def Jam Records and you know they put out a single called Yes Sir, there's a video for that. Like a promotional video. And like it didn't really do very well, and you know they Def Jam really they showed the album, so that's why the album never came out. Uh, the new religion by Capone Noriega. So uh, number nine, One Fan a Day by Noriega or Nori. That was supposed to come out back in 2006. Um, that never came out. It got shelved again by Def Jam Records. Um, and um. It, and then he eventually came out with that reggaeton album he dropped back in 2006. So I was pretty much like a replacement of that album. And, um, you know, at that time, like, Noriega, he was really big into reggaeton. He was big into his whole Puerto Rican pride and that kind of thing. He was really big into that at that time. Um, but, you know, just, I didn't really bother with that. Cause I, I don't like reggaeton. I really don't like that shit at all. That shit's mad annoying. Um, it, it, it's worse than mumble music to me. Like, I don't really like mumble music trap music now so to me reggaeton is like trap music of spanish of latin music in my opinion but you know that's what it is that's just my opinion though and then capone he was supposed to come out with his first album um pain time and glory back in 2001 but because he got locked up right after the reunion album which came out 2000 that, like I said, that album was supposed to come out in 2001, but he got locked up because I think he violated his probation. It was like, a, I think he had like a gun charge, that's how he got released, and he violated that shit, and that's why it never, the album never came out until 2005. And I, I do have that album, and it's really not that good. <laughs> I'm just going to keep it a buck. It's not that good at all. Oh, shit. Yeah, so... Just wasn't feeling that. So that's saw uh, Noriega with One Fan a Day and Capone Noriega. Capone with Pain, Time, and Glory, which was due to be released in 2001, but didn't until 2005. And the last one is Noriega affiliated, uh, Mussolini and Mace. I'm pretty sure you guys know them. If you guys follow Capone Noriega or the Noriega solo album, the first two solo albums at least, uh, Mussolini and Mace from, I think they're from Left Rack. Um, you know, Noriega is, you know, affiliates and stuff like that. Um, they were featuring on uh, It's Not a Game off of Noriega's first album. They did, God damn, it's fucking reggae, man. Jesus Christ. Oh, sorry about that. <laughs> Yeah, so, like I was saying before, um, they were featured on the song, um, It's Not a Game, off of Nori's first album. I then did, did, did a couple of tracks on, um, uh, what's the name, uh, the Melvin Flint um, album, his second album, did a couple of joints on that joint. And um, the name of the album that they were supposed to drop was called Golden Skies. And the only reason I remember that is because... Um, I remember finding a song of them on YouTube. It was a song called um, Let's Start a Hustle or whatever, or Let's Start a Struggle, something like that. And it was a dope song. It was like an unreleased song. It was supposed to be on their first album, Golden Skies. 
And I couldn't remember the name of the, of the album. So I recently had to go check the Melvin Flynn album. And I remember there was a picture of the album. It was called Golden Sky. You see mostly and Mace. And you see like a, like a golden background. And it was like, oh, okay, okay. I fucks with this. You know what I'm saying? But then they had a couple of songs that was leaked off that album. That's on YouTube. Uh, it was on the SPK's uh, YouTube channel. SPK Killer, I think is, is his YouTube name. And the album never came out. And I think it's because of sample clearances or just Noriega not being a good businessman. I'm um, just to keep it a buck, you know what I mean? Which is not is not surprising when it comes to like, you know, some of these artists, man. Like dope MCs, but you know, when it comes to business, they suck. And I think that was the case with Noriega's case with Mussolini and Mace. So but um I would love for them to do an interview. Um to speak on their piece, like why they didn't come out with an album. And that's pretty much it, guys. I uh, hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, like I said, I'm gonna do. I'm gonna record one more video of this installment. Then I'm gonna put the put it to rest. I'm gonna focus more on um, reviews, cause I know I owe you guys some reviews and stuff like that. So I hope you guys enjoyed this video. Um, Y'all be easy. Peace.